this um, shows a summary of all um, the major element, the major cells in the Theron Mountains and the variation in their chemistry, their major element chemistry. As you can see, the number of analyses varies. Um, 19 for the sharp capping cell, but seven or eight for most of the others. Next. And that shows the um, two, three of the significant elements and their variation between the major cells, um, the scalp capping cell, the middle cell, Colseen clips, basal cells at Colseen clips and Lentin blood, and the, the two layered cells. Next. And this shows the, the general relationships in terms of um, the sort of differentiation sequence um, that you can actually find within um, the cells uh, in um, the Theron Mountains alongside the Jurassic basalts that occur in Johnny Mortland um, to the east of uh, the Theron. Next. And this is looking at the um, mean chemical analyses of Gondwana dolerites. There are dolerites of Jurassic, some extending into Cretaceous age throughout Antarctica. The Farrar dolerites have been known ever since um, Scott's discovery expedition. Um, there are also uh, similar age dolerites in Tasmania and the Karoo dolerites in South Africa are well known, as are uh, the Sarah Goral um, dolerites in South America. I did um, a massive literature search um, and uh, looked at the, the, a number of analyses that in the published literature at the time to get the, uh, the, the results shown in this table. Next, and this shows the um, frequency percentages for the same sequence with the Theron Mountains and, and turning more land in the bottom, extending through. And what these tend to confirm is the fact that there are in 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 total in the, in Gondwana dolerites, there are actually two different sequences. There's the Karoo Serra Garal uh, sequence. Um, and on the other side, there's the Feral uh, Tasmanian sequence. They are different chemically, they are different mineralogically. And um, at the time, there was certainly some speculation that, in fact, is it that the uh, Feral Tasman side are actually contaminated as opposed to the uncontaminated Karoo Serra Garal side. Looking at the analysis of the, of the Theron Mountains, it would appear that the scarp capping seal is probably most closely allied uh, to the Ferrado rights, but some of the other seals there are much more closely allied to the Karoo Dolorites in um, South America. And one of the reasons next that this might be so is, is the fact that the, their ages. Um, if you look, for example, at Sarah Garal uh, from 100 to 164 million years of Karoo, um, middle uh, and lower Jurassic, um, but the rest, they uh, they're all roughly the same age. But if you that, then look at what actually happened to Gondwana during that period, next. Sorry, those are the ages um, and the, the source of the ages. Next. Then you will see this um, at about the time when 
Kuru said a girl. Uh, toll rights were being deposited. Africa and South America were actually splitting from um, Antarctica. But Australia and Tasmania and the rest of Antarctica were still very much fitted together until much later. So um, my speculation at the time was that in fact there was actually a difference in the composition of the mantle. Um, but looking at some of the work that's been done much more recently, <coughs> it may well be that what happened in the Farrar Tasman side was that the, the magma came part way up and then became slightly contaminated before it was actually um, eroded, erupted. Um, and um, that is because of the fact that the, 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 the rupture between Australia and Antarctica did not occur at the same time as the um, intrusion of the dolerites. Next. Uh, this is just a brief summary of the publications that I made on the Feral Mountains. As you can see, I covered a fair number of things. But the one thing that's missing, of course, is the um, description of the dolerites. And um, my next, my conclusion remarks relate to that because when I, when I actually submitted this, uh, the PhD thesis at the University of Birmingham in 1971, I was actually uh, quite proud yeah. of it. But um, I then wrote it up uh, as a draft scientific report. Um, my um, thesis was examined. It wasn't examined immediately because my external examiner, Sandy Knuckles, retired uh, just at the wrong time. And when I first went to visit him to have a viva with him and my uh, internal examiner, Ray Eady of the, well, the British Antarctic Survey, I unfortunately got a migraine, so it had to be postponed. And eventually the, uh, the PhD was awarded in 1973. But there was a, a, a slight <coughs> difference of opinion between myself and Ray Eady. And um, as a result, the, sci the scientific report was never, never published. However, what I have been doing recently is to publish elements of it uh, within the uh, newsletter of the Home Counties North Regional Group of the Geological Society. So if you want more details about um, the Dolorites, that is the place to look on the JOLSOC website. I hope that gives you sufficient information, and I hope I haven't been too much of a wanderer and been too garbled. And that is basically what I have to say. I'm open to questions. I can't guarantee to answer them because, as I say, 50 years since I did the work, and I've not been involved in either mineralogy or geochemistry uh, since that time. Thank you very much, Dave. Well, at least you've clapped. <laughs> I can't. I'm, I'm I can't. The one that's not muted. Everybody else. Everybody's is... muted at the moment. It takes <laughs> them longer to find their unmute button. button I, I was ready for it. <laughs> I, I can't say I've followed it all, Dave, but uh, I'm sure there's other people in the uh, audience who are bursting to ask a few questions. I, I, there's one thing I did want to make an observation. At the beginning, but first of all, thank you for a really, really interesting talk, Dave. Um, at the beginning of the talk, you were showing lots of photographs of the tips of these mountains poking out of the ice. Yeah. I just wondered how much of those mountains is poking out of the ice now? Because that was... Um, I don't think it's changed a great deal, to be honest. Good. Um, because the, the general <clears throat> the, the, the general feeling with um, snow cover in the Antarctica is that it hasn't actually reduced much inland. Okay, the Bailey Ice Stream, which flows down the front of the range, 
and the slicey graph there, which falls down the back of the range, um, are probably moving fairly quickly. Yeah. And they certainly join uh, the recovery glass here, which is the other side of the Shackleton range, uh, further oh. to the south. And um, they are moving fairly quickly into the Pilsner Ice Shelf. But the Pilsner Ice Shelf itself uh, is actually grounded on Berkner Island um, before it t turns into the uh, Ronnie Ice Shelf further to the west. Um, so I suspect there's not a great, been a great deal of change. There was a lot of melting going on at the time in the mm -hmm. summer. The temperature occasionally got up above zero. Um, so we, we had to put uh, um, a sweater on sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> not, not all the time, but sometimes. Um, and then you would also find the, the, that, in fact, you were actually getting uh, frost nip on the end of your nose and sunburn underneath it because the sun would reflect off the eyes. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Oh, Wonderful days. Talk, Mark. It was really good. <clears throat> that. Uh, although I'm in the gloom, I'd like to ask a question if possible. Oh, who's that? Liz Aston from. Oh, uh, Liz, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, how, how long in millions of years from the beginning to the end of all the uh, intrusions, roughly? Um, well, the dates that were. That were done by uh, David Rex at the University of Leeds on my specimens range from 154 to 169 million years. Yeah. Um, the dates for um, the specimens collected by Lewis Jukes, who was the geologist who preceded me, who worked in uh, the Vestfjella and the Heimfrenfjella in Drunning Mordland, were roughly the same. I have heard since from a geologist who was actually working for, for the British Antarctic Survey, um, that they reckoned that, in fact, they were actually all intruded very, very quickly. Uh, and that's what I'm wondering. That it, that it actually happened within a, mi a, a million years or so. Wow. I, 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 I've never been convinced of that. No. Um, but this particular geologist did surprise me on one occasion because I always used to say that the advantage of working in Antarctica was that nobody ever goes back. <laughs> and I, I, I was with him waiting for transport to a meeting. Um, and I mentioned this to him. And he said, do you know where I was three weeks ago? <laughs> He'd actually been in the Sierra Mountains three weeks before I actually met him. So people do go back. <laughs> um, wow. and they, do, they do check things. But the other thing that I would say about the work I did, I was proud of it at the time. Now, having gone through uh, some of the work I did then and looked at what I did, I'm actually astounded that I managed to get a PhD out of it. <laughs> because there were so many things that I omitted to do. I mean, <clears throat> you saw my analyses. And you saw that I collected one specimen from the layer uh, in the middle of the Jeffreys Glacier layered sail and one from below it. <clears throat> On the layered sail in Melrose Cliffs, I collected one sample from uh, a darker layer and one from a lighter layer. There were eight or nine different layers there, which are all of which should have been collected. Mm. And I didn't do that. Well, you have to go back. It was a total cock up, to be honest. <laughs> I don't think so at all. But at the time, nobody had been back, so they couldn't argue, could they? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Probably.